another edition of Flea Market Fantasy, the world's second greatest Bronze Age era comic book podcast. Joining me as always is new Mike L. Kevin Jank. No time to waste on introducing me when there's like 500 characters we have to introduce <laughs> in this book. Yeah, it's a big one. A lot of characters. <laughs> well, we did introduce a lot of these characters in previous episodes of Flea Market Fantasy, so I took a lot of shortcuts. We're not going to talk about everybody. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, but the issue we're doing today is All-Star Squadron Annual 3. From 1984, I believe this is 1984. Did not now, seem like 1984. Yeah. I guess that's what they were going for, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. The story is set in 1942, I believe. So yeah, uh, yeah they're trying to get that uh, old school feel to it. But uh, the writer here is Roy Thomas, and there are a bunch of artists because this is an oh, annual. Yeah. Yeah, there's like six or seven artists. I think. Yeah, there's the artists that just come in to do like two pages and then out. <laughs> Because it's a long story. Last week, I warned you that, you know, it's pretty lengthy. I don't know. I, was the final? I think it was around 48 pages, right? Is that what it was? I think it was like 44, I think. Oh, okay. The page count. Yeah. Look at that. Felt longer. Felt longer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the reason I picked this book is because when I was a kid, I loved All-Star Squadron and Justice Society from the DC world. And th- they're both in this, this, you know, Justice Society is featured in this annual. And uh, I just remember this book vividly from when I was a child. And just because you get heroes matched up against villains and it's all pretty cool. And now when I go back and I read it, you know, almost 40 years later. Yeah, it's rough. <laughs> it <is> rough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're really matching heroes up against the scrubs of the villain world. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about it. <laughs> But uh, what I remember, I don't know if you picked up on this, but when I was a kid, I was very, uh, I was, this just shows you the difference from 1984 till now. But when I was a kid reading this book, there were two curse words in this book. Ooh. Yeah. So I thought I should hide this under the mattress or something. You know, like this is pretty serious. (laughs) And now you probably didn't even notice. Did you notice the, the swears? No, I honestly didn't. Uh, well, there's a, there's a dam. To to well, there's not there's not really swear. A dam and a hell. <laughs> but for me, oh, yeah, nine yeah. year old me, I thought, oh, oh my god, I'm gonna oh, go my. to hell. Like, yeah, <laughs> I went to Catholic school, you know. I can't be reading this stuff. This smut. This it's is ironic that they're like they're gonna teach you about hell, but you can't say hell. What is it? Yeah. Which is it? What do you want? So, all right, we'll break down All Star Squadron Annual Three here in a minute. But first, Jank, let's remind everybody if you're watching us on YouTube. Please like and subscribe. We're up to 96 subscribers, Jank. We picked up another four this week. Ooh, so wow. That's pretty good. close. So at that oh. same pace, we will hit 100 this week. That would be amazing. That really wow, could be. Yeah. So let's go. Let's rally <laughs> I the we'd ever do that, let alone this year. So Let's rally the <laughs> flea army. Come on, four more. Tell your friends and neighbors. <laughs> yeah, pyramid scheme this shit. Yeah. Hey, you friends, have that tell two friends? <laughs> yeah, you just swore. My, uh, I can write for All Star Squadron. <laughs> so, but yeah, on the YouTube page, we got the, the full link podcast and you can watch videos and there's all kind of pictures throughout the, uh, the video there, you know. Jank and I don't mm-hmm. appear on screen because nobody wants that. But <laughs> no. there are lots of pictures of comics in there. And then we also, uh, release a bunch of shorts throughout the week, uh, probably about two a day, different little shorts. A lot. We just cut up clips from the show, but then I go back and I put in like actual panels from the comics we're discussing, like to get more in depth, you know, so you can yeah. see. And it's uh, it's all pretty fancy. All nooks and crannies. Yeah. In fact, earlier today, uh, of course, we're recording this, but we put up one about Atomic Skull having sex with a cat. So I'm very proud. <laughs> okay. Truly our classiest entry yet since the Green Lantern. Yes. And his uh, underage girlfriend. <laughs> so, yes, please go like and subscribe on YouTube. We would appreciate it. All right, so let's get to this All-Star Annual, uh, All-Star Squadron Annual 3. Now, we did All-Star Squadron in the first year of this show. You were not here, Jake. This was uh, me and Mike L doing this. And we talked about all the main characters of All-Star Squadron. But actually, they're not in this book, really. Um, this is mostly just Justice Society. Yeah. Because I think the original, uh, when we did All- All-Star Squadron, by the way, you should go to Comic Book Syndicate, uh, there, the uh, Mike Ells YouTube page, and maybe I'll put up a, a short of this. But the All-Star Squadron review had probably the funniest moment in flea market fantasy history. Oh, yeah. When Mike Ells just burst out <laughs> laughing and he couldn't control himself about Roy Thomas's dialogue. 
<laughs> there <laughs> <it> was. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty great. Yeah, so maybe I will make a short about that. But yeah, Roy Thomas has a, uh, plenty of gems in this issue as well. Dialogue. <laughs> yeah, he's Good got work. a knack for that old timey dialogue. Oof. But basically, All Star Squadron was uh, Roy Thomas. He wanted to write about the Justice Society kind of heroes because the Justice Society, for those who aren't aware, they were uh, put off under Earth Two in the DC universe. This was back when mm-hmm. they had the two Earths or whatever. But they were like all the Golden Age era heroes. They were like the first superheroes. All the old school guys from the 40s. So I always thought they were cool when I was a kid. Used to have these characters still be around somewhere, but it not be a part of the main universe. So like, yeah, we'll make it a whole separate Earth. Yeah, so I was always an Earth 2 guy when I was a kid. <laughs> uh, big fan of Earth 2. Do you think there's an Earth 2 out there right Earth now, Jay? Time. Another version of me and you doing a podcast <laughs> out there on Earth 2? Yeah, they probably have like millions of subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? But this All-Star Squadron... It's basically a way for uh, Roy Thomas and DC to talk about those old school characters again. He did something similar at Marvel with the Invaders, where they took yeah. ca- Captain America, Submariner. Uh, who else was in the Invaders? Human Torch, Toro. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Toro. Little Human Torch, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they, they, that was set in World War II. And it was just a way to tell World War II stories with heroes. And so then he comes to D.C. and he's like, hey, let's just do that again, but with uh, All-Star Squadron. <laughs> and in the uh, books, uh, FDR, Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt, he says, hey, you know what? I need a team of superheroes to fight the Nazi scourge. So he uh, he he rounds up all the superheroes and they become the All-Star Squadron. Sometimes, Jank, uh, my nickname for you in my mind is uh, Janklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's... <laughs> It's pretty good, right? Wish polio upon me, but okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> four, four term presidency, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, you take but, the good with the bad, I guess. <laughs> uh, so that's the uh, origin here of the All Star Squadron, the team at least. Now, they, they first appeared in Justice League of America 193 in 1981, and they were created by Roy Thomas, uh, Rich Buckler, and Jerry Ordway. And again, they're set in the 1940s during World War II. The name All-Star Squadron is a tribute to All-Star Comics, the 1940 title in which the Justice Society first appeared. And uh, there was a, there's actually an All-Star Comics revival in 1976. I was not aware of this. And it picked up with issue 58, and it ran for 17 issues until ending in 1979. So basically, we get those old uh, heroes in this that series as well, so we're probably going to be reading that at some point. <laughs> I would like to check that oh, one out. Oh boy! Yeah, I hope Thomas wrote that as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the All Star Squadron was just another attempt to bring back the Justice Society characters. Issue one came out in 1981, and the series ran for 67 issues, ending in 1987. And I had several of them when I was a child. I don't think it was like a monthly buy for me or anything. This was when I was like real young, you know. But I had a handful of them, and uh, there are some other characters we should. Uh, talk about in here they're pretty famous i thought last week i mentioned i thought black canary was in this she is not in this not at all but, no Seth left yeah, her out no fishnets but we get superman we get batman we get, get a the, very sexy Catwoman. that's for sure yeah Catwoman was getting done <laughs> in a cocktail dress and a cat mask <laughs> i don't know yeah. <laughs> oh, dr skull would be or atomic skull would be all over her <laughs> you wouldn't know what to do half woman half cat <laughs> All right, so uh, we get the old school Flash, Jay Garrick, the guy with the uh, metal hat, and you know running around. Uh, we get Doctor Fate, the Spectre. I like Sandman. that. Uh, find on this issue that Jay Garrick does have a uh, superhero, you know, secret identity. I don't know how that happens when he's just a dude in a little helmet that doesn't block <laughs> his face at all. <laughs> There's a moment where Starman shows up because he's going to be joining uh, Justice uh, Society at, uh, at the end of this issue. But he shows up and he goes, that's when I decided to become a mask superhero. And someone thinks next to him, I can't even remember who it is, we'll encounter. They're like, He's, how do you call that a mask? His face, you can see his face. <laughs> <laughs> like, just, his hair is covered. It's not a mask. Anyway, anyway. I gotta say, I did like Starman in this issue. Uh, we'll get to that later. Yeah, this, this is the good Starman, not all the other Starmans that Mike Gale made us read. Yeah. This is the old school <laughs> Starman with his gravity rod. Yeah. <laughs> can't remember the yep. last time I used my gravity rod. All right, so uh, who, like who else? Time goes on, the gravity affects it even more. <laughs> so then, uh, Batman and Robin are in this as well. And uh, did I mention Superman? Yeah, heard of them. Lois, 
Lois Lane is in here. Yeah, she's a piece of work. Yeah, <laughs> Hour Man. Good old Hour <laughs> Man. And yep. There's a lot of stuff to talk about in this. All right, we'll go through the villains when we encounter them. But uh, there's a couple other people we need to talk about. Uh, Tarantula. Are you, yeah. are you aware of this guy? Uh, no, I was familiar with the Marvel, you know, Spider-Man Tarantula. But other than yeah. that, no. <laughs> but I, I believe nowadays there's a modern Tarantula, and she it's a lady. Oh, okay. She's going around. But this Tarantula, the first one, his name is Jonathan Law, his real name. And his first appearance was in Star Spangled Comics, issue one, 1941, created by Mort Wasinger and Harold Wilson Sharp. He was a crime writer and a superhero. Whoa, yeah. this could be you. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> he was so inspired by chronicling the lives and the efforts of these superheroes, he decided to become one himself. And uh, he carried a web gun and he clung to walls with suction cups. He was actually referred to as Spider-Man a few times in his first appearance without the hyphen, but it was never his official name. So that's pretty weird. You know, like when did he uh, first appear? 1941. And so, yeah, really? if he would have stuck, if they would actually call him Spider-Man, what's history like? Yeah, that? they would have had something. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, he quit being a superhero after World War II. And in the 1960s, he wrote a best-selling book called Altered Egos. The Mystery Men of World War II. And then I think later on he had died and his apartment building blew up or something. Ooh, that's sad. That's, that's like a dark turn. Not since, yeah, maybe, uh, you know, like Dino Riders have we had such a, a dark turn for uh, the creators. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> but uh, this is a good old tarantula. And in this outfit, uh, this uh, issue, he's wearing like a brown outfit and uh, with a black spider logo on it and stuff. You don't see a lot of brown superhero costumes. No, yeah, I, I guess kind of see why. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a very appealing color. I guess his in his original appearance, he wore like a blue and yellow costume, but it was originally made for his buddy, uh, the Atom, I think. Right. But or oh, Sandman. Yeah, him in this issue, too. There's oh, yeah. so many people. I couldn't keep track. <laughs> <laughs> so but he so he got his own outfit then when the uh, later on. But, yeah, we'll see Tarantula in this. He's like in the framing device, uh, Tarantula and Wonder Woman. And then they get a flashback all of a year earlier. <laughs> yep. <laughs> just soon, or just, you know, late enough that Wonder Woman was not a part of the team yet. She missed it by a couple months. <laughs> all right. The main villain in this book is a fellow named Ian Karkle. First appearance was More Fun Comics, issue 69, 1941, created by Gardner Fox and Howard Sherman. He was a scientist and sorcerer and an enemy of Dr. Fate. And uh, in the 1930s, Karkle was an archaeologist working in the Sahara Desert with his research partner, Everett Dahlin. The two men were searching for the lost city of Ragnar, which was known for its wealth. They found the city, but they ended up fighting over a giant ruby, and Dahlin bashed Karkle senseless and left him for dead. Karkle survived, and he used his scientific genius to invent a machine that could turn men into shadows. He used the machine <laughs> to get revenge on Dahlin. But then uh, Dr. Fate destroyed the machine, condemning Karkle to a shadowy form. Yeah, that's, that's where cool. we find it in this issue. Touching. All these villains in this issue, like, they pretty much were in the 1940s. They appeared, like, once, and then they typically look like they died at the end of their appearance. And mm -hmm. then they just brought them back for this story. So these characters we meet in here, these villains, they it's not like they have a storied histories throughout DC. It's just, yeah, these are one-offs. And like, then they come back. Yeah. So I kind of like that. You know, Roy Thomas did his, his research. He dug out, found some old villains, and brought them back. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. So, like, these uh, other appearances they mention in here, like, Superman's like, oh, I just fought this lightning guy, like, a week ago. Was that actually in the old comics, or was that in, you know, All-Star Squadron? Old comics. Yeah, okay. old comics. Yep, yep. So, yeah, that's kind of cool how they did that, too, like, uh, later back because yeah. I, I guess there, I don't know, we'll get, we'll get into more stuff as we go through the book, because there's a lot to talk about here. You did mention Catwoman, old Selena yeah. Kyle. It, it is the same Catwoman. About this costume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about it. She's uh, wearing a very sexy dress, I would say. A normal dress, but it's a low cut. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not a superhero outfit, you would think. You would see a lady in. But uh, not when you're like a thief, you would think. Yeah, you want a little more of the skin tight look like the Julie Newmar one had, but kind of a normal dress and then a full on cat mask. Like, <laughs> like he's the furry. 
<laughs> like, did you know that uh, her first appearance was in Batman issue one, 1940? I did not know that. Uh, I don't think yeah. I did. It's pretty crazy. No. Uh, created by Bill Finger and Bob Kane. Yeah, that first issue of Batman, I went back and looked at it the, uh, the other night. It's got like uh, three or four stories in it. Because, you know, it was the old days, that's how they did it. Oh, yeah. So, like, I think the first one's Joker. And then there's a couple other ones. And then there's a Catwoman one. She's disguised as a uh, big old fat lady. She's trying to rob a place. But, of course, Batman knows it's her, you know. Like, he ripped off the mask. And he's like, ah, you're a foxy lady, you know. And he's smitten with her. <laughs> you're not a fat woman. You're a Catwoman. <laughs> and so Robin and Batman are, like, uh, arresting her, you know. They're, they're, for some reason, they're on a boat. And they're taking her back on a boat. And she jumps overboard and swims to freedom, you know. And Robin goes to jump after her. And Batman acts like he accidentally gets in the way of Robin. He's like, oh, sorry, Robin. But he did it on purpose because he wanted Catwoman to escape. Oh, look uh, at that. Batman, yeah, he's sweet on her already. He's already in love, yeah. And then uh, I think she came back in, like, issues two and three as well. So, wow. Uh, yeah, this Catwoman. She was all over the place back then. Like the rest but, of these villains, she actually, you know, got some good play even back then. There's a villain in here. I forgot to look him up. There's there's a villain called Tarantula in this book. Like, oh wh- why, why would you do That's that? So why would you? Yeah. I know. Why would you, why? Thomas, find another villain. It's, uh, it's just a guy in, like, a blue yeah. mask and a hood. And uh, he's yeah, only... Some of these costumes were very similar and not good. But of all the villains you could find, you couldn't find another one who isn't named Tarantula, just like the hero at the beginning of this book? Come on. What are we doing? Uh... All right, so I guess that's all the background we need for this to begin. We'll talk about some more of these villains as we go. But, Jank, would you like to describe the cover for us? Oh, boy. Uh, it's it's not a great cover, I'll say that. Oh, how about but, uh, it starts <laughs> with the DC logo in the top left and then another circle in the other top right there saying it's buck twenty five for this annual. That's what's going to run you. Yeah, that's, that's pricey. Uh, annual is really big across the top. Uh, then we get the Roy Thomas, Rick Hogberg, and Friends. All-Star Squadron starring the Justice Society of America. And there's like a red sky, and we get our charcoal guy. In well, it's kind of like brownish, form. no? I think it's a more brown. Yeah, I mean, it's like a crimson-y red. Kind of brown. It could be tarantula color, I guess. Uh, we, so he's in his shadow form, and like the background somehow is bigger than the entire city of New York, it appears. The teams are teaming up to you take him down. We got Green Lantern. Uh, the old school Green Lantern using his his ring on him, just kind of blasting him in the face with it. Doctor Fate's down there on the ground shooting up some kind of mystical beam at him uh, with the little onk symbol going on. Superman's just kind of flying around, not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> like he's pulling his fist back, like he's gonna do something, but maybe not. We'll see how it goes. Batman's just kind of swinging in. This is probably a fight he can't help out too much. <laughs> <laughs> Batarang ain't gonna solve this problem. Um, then we got Jay Garrick, the Flash, just kind of running in, being like, hey, what's going on? And, uh, there's our man, just kind of standing with his mouth agape, and Wonder Woman's also there watching this, even though she was not a part of this, as we learned. Yeah. She will not join the team for another year. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a goof. It's a chance for a no prize if this was Marvel. We could try and explain yes. away why she, yeah, she should not <laughs> be there. But I like this cover when I was a kid, you know, the big shadowy guy coming in, rah, looking all mean and. <laughs> Uh, Ian Carcol. <laughs> he doesn't look very even as a shadow guy, he doesn't look very cool. <laughs> you need some cool shadow hair or something. I was a big uh, Doctor Fate mark as a kid. I think he always looks cool. The blue and yellow yeah. costume and the ox. I do like him. the helmet. Yeah, it's a pretty nice look. Yeah, he's pretty awesome. No gripes there. All right, yeah, I, I like this cover. It's a uh, man a dollar twenty five. That's yeah, that's pricey. Little me was rolling in it apparently. I can buy it. <laughs> You're mowing a lot of lawns. <laughs> yeah, and the, the artists here are Rich Buckler, Wayne Boring, uh, Keith Giffen, a, Richard Howe, Carmine Infantino, Don Newton, Mark, Mark O'Dell. don't know him either. Jerry Ordway and George Perez. Yeah, I didn't research any of them because... Yeah, there's just so many. Yeah, we're just sorry. And we've talked about Buckler before on here. And, uh, Carmine, yeah, and George you know, Perez. Course, course. Ordway, yeah. I think we've talked about as well. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, was uh, part of that Justice League book. And Hobart did the cover. And I, I think we'll get to it later, but I think my favorite art in this book is Keith Giffen. Yeah, me too. Eight. Agreed. Yeah, that great. one's definitely the one that jumped out to me. It was the least golden age, I think, which is why I liked it. Yeah. All 
All right, so we open up the book and uh, we get a little uh, introduction here. 1942, a world at war. Though, this ad, like most of like, the ads, of this book, I definitely had a comic book that came out this same month because I recognized like all of these ads from my childhood. <laughs> yeah, describe this first ad on the inside cover for the people. Uh, we get the ad for the superpowers collection of action figures. Um, and there's like a action figure of Superman. You squeeze his legs and he punches and he's punching like a comic book version of Lex Luthor. I actually had that Superman figure and a lot of these figures here when I was a kid and just recently sold them. Yeah, and I recognize, yeah. I recognize this ad as well when I saw it. I was like, oh yeah. And I didn't ever had these, you know, I was a Marvel kid even then. So I don't think I had any of these, but, uh, yeah. I Hawk. had uh, Superman for sure. I think I had the Joker. I have a couple of Batmans, a couple of Robins. Uh, I had Lex Luthor, but I lost like the top part of his uh, armor, so he's <laughs> kind of a green chested dude. I definitely had that penguin for sure. Yeah, penguin comes with an umbrella. Green lantern. He's got his little lantern with him. That's a, yeah, yeah, made made from by Kenner, same people that did Star Wars. All right, so then we look at the uh, book. There's a little intro. 1942, a world at war, and against the forces of Axis darkness, the mightiest heroes of Earth too have banded together. Under direct orders of the president, Janklin Delano Roosevelt, as the All Star <laughs> Squadron, dun, 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 and this is the prologue, and the art is by Jerry Ordway, and we see some gangster-looking fellows with guns, and mm. uh, here, here, let's get a sampling of the uh, Roy Thomas dialogue here. Uh, Midnight in Manhattan, late February, 1942. I can't see him any longer. Is he still coming? Ja, I think so. So dark. <laughs> Who is he anyway? <laughs> He's so emo, this guy. What does it matter? We must get out of here. That's so I don't know, man. It's rough. Yeah. All right. So uh, the bad guys try to fly away, and we get a flip. That's uh, close to the Spider-Man thwip. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> uh, wow. Some sure rope trade. goes around him there. There's web gun. And then we get a shot of the tarantula. He's a blonde-haired white fella in a brown costume. And it's a pretty nifty little costume. I don't know. It's not bad. It's not bad. I mean, it's okay. It's it's no Spider-Man costume, that's for sure. But yeah. And uh, he's chasing after them. <laughs> you know how he, else he isn't like Spider-Man? He trips over toolboxes. <laughs> yep. No spider sense or even peripheral vision, apparently, because, yeah, he's like, oh, these rocks can't stop me, but this toolbox will. <laughs> His trips, it falls down. So the, uh, the, the filthy Nazi guys, they're going to gun him down there. And uh, then we get some more forced dialogue from Thomas trying yeah, to give us a weird. history lesson. And it's all very confusing. And, yeah. But then the wonder what regards to Ernst Rahm. Yeah. You write trans ought to be ashamed of yourselves, equating New York's resident web weaver with the head honcho of the original Nazi stormtroopers. <laughs> murdered with 200 others by Hitler's orders on the night of June 30th, 1934. <laughs> That's the editors. No. Explain yeah. it all. Jeez. But the equating New York's resident web weaver with the head honcho of the original Nazi, that was Wonder Woman saying that. Yes. That was actually her dialogue. That wasn't an editor's yeah. note. Sounds and just it. like her. <laughs> Unless she's probably been in, like, a, you know, the man's world for, like, three days at this point. <laughs> but, but she yeah, knows all about the history of World War II. Yeah, she jumps down on a ladder from the Invisible Jet, I guess, and she lasses up the Nazis and uh, slams them together and knocks them out. Then she's talking to Tarantula, and he's like, well, man, ah, good. thank God you're here, Wonder Woman, because that toolbox nearly took me out or whatever. And they <laughs> open it up, and she just rips open the box, and because uh, it's metal, you know, she's bang, bust the lock. She's a badass. And they mm -hmm. find some uh, foul fours in there, newspaper clippings. They're like, hey, uh, well, what do we do with these, you know? We should go uh, research these. So they go back to their uh, headquarters. Now, do you recognize uh, this headquarters there, Jack? Are you a history buff? Um... I had no idea that this was an actual thing because their headquarters, it's like a big ball and then like a big spire behind it. And that yeah. was actually the try on in the Paris sphere. They were constructed in Flushing Meadows Park in Queens for the 1939 World's Fair. And okay. the, the trilon was a 610 foot triangular pylon. So they called it the trilon. The Paris sphere was a sphere with 180 foot diameter. So these are actual landmarks at the time. And uh, the Justice uh, or All Star Squadron were using it, or Justice Society. I don't know what we're talking about here. Even though it's an All Star, <laughs> it's all one big. It's all very confusing. <laughs> but they use it as their headquarters, and I had no idea that was a real thing. And I, I think it they still last exists. Like the, no, oh, okay. they. I think they went away in like the '60s or something. Oh, 
So uh, look at that, more history. From, I feel like uh, working out of Disneyland. <laughs> We're going to go use the big ball at Epcot Center as our hideout. But apparently at this Perisphere, they have some sort of computer machine where you uh, uh, you put stuff into a slot. And then it, like, mm-hmm. I don't know, lets you relive it somehow. <laughs> I think that's yeah. what they – isn't that how they explain it? A Nickelodeon it? machine, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they can, like, go back in time and uh, watch how things happened all because of this computer they got. And, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't seem possible. But, hey, whatever. They and, definitely didn't have colored film by that point. So I don't know how they're recording all this. So basically that's the the framing is we get Wonder Woman and Tarantula. And then the actual story takes place one year earlier, just a couple months before, you know, Wonder Woman actually joined the Justice Society or whatever. And so they're watching the other members of the Justice Society have a meeting. And they're basically watching a TV screen. Then the story plays out for the reader over the next 40 pages of awesomeness. We get another great ad, though, before that, where uh, this I remember this ad very well, too. It's a Fig Newton ad where there's you can get like a first edition collector's edition first issue of free Batman comic book. Makes it look, look like it's Detective Comics number 27, the first appearance of Batman, but it's just a reprint. Uh, but you send in three proofs of purchase, you get that. And somebody wrote their name in into the box here for the <laughs> yeah. comic book order form. And apparently this cool kid's name is Dino Wheeler. <laughs> It's amazing. Yeah, I think that's whoever, like, you know, uh, scanned the copy of his book. Like, oh, okay. So, yeah, he did that after the fact. <laughs> Dino Wheeler. They lived in Arizona. Wow, that like a cool dude. Uh, <laughs> but he had a P.O. box. That seems weird that a child had a P.O. box back in the day, whatever. whatever. But uh, Dino <laughs> Wheeler. Shady shit, even back then. <laughs> All right, so we look in on this uh, Justice Society meeting. And they're trying to raise what is it? Are they trying to raise a million dollars for? Uh... Yeah, that's this was a weird uh, way to start a story. <laughs> they're like, okay, you, we, each of you were in charge of getting a hundred thousand dollars, even though you're superheroes and you should be saving people for you know the benefit <laughs> of it, not for rewards. But they're raising this money to war. try and help uh, no, orphans. Just, yeah, yeah, from good cause. The war. Yeah, it, like German and uh, Japanese children, right? Isn't that what they said? I think so. Yeah. So uh, look at them being nice people and all their heroes, but they're trying to raise a million dollars. Each of them says we'll raise a hundred thousand dollars. So they go through like how they raise the money. Sandbagged with having to do three times as much. Yeah, Johnny Thunder said he raised three hundred (laughs) thousand. And then they get all mad at him when he didn't come up with it. Yeah, he didn't come up with any though. To be fair, he did kind of suck. So they go around the table. Green Lantern uh, busted up some. Well, what did he do? Some sort of a uh, fraud scheme or something, and then he got a reward. Basically, they all busted a bunch of crooks and they got rewards. That's how they got their money. Yeah. Basically, like they saved a rich guy and then the rich guy would give him money, or like they would. The, I I foiled a bank robbery and the bank just gave me some money. Yeah, hundred so, oh, cool. grand back in 1942. Holy hell, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. this is 41 a year earlier. So uh, that's a whole lot of money. And uh, Hawkman is also in this book. I don't know if we've he mentioned saved a newspaper publisher. Yeah. And apparently, I don't know, a good J. Jonah Jameson type just gave him a bunch of money. So uh, Johnny Thunder, I don't know. We haven't really mentioned him yet, but we've talked about him previously on the show when we did a, uh, I believe, a Justice League issue. But he's just uh, like, I think it's supposed to be like a teenager, I think. But he's yeah. a blonde haired kid in a green suit and a bow tie. And he, when he says a magic word, I forget what it is, like Sue, uh, Sue in or something like that, this <laughs> giant pink lightning bolt guy comes out of somewhere. I don't know. just appears out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Or not to know where <laughs> it comes out of exactly. And he can do all kind of crazy lightning bolt guy kind of things. But, yeah, so he's a that, – that's his name, Johnny Thunder, right? Yeah. Yep. And then yep. lightning bolt. You know. And they're like, yeah, you get $300,000. That seems like a great idea. Yeah, he volunteered to do it. I guess he thought he could come up with the money. And they busted up some guys pretending to be Justice Society members. But then, like, mm-hmm. no one gave him a reward. So he's like, we didn't get paid for that. Yeah. And everyone like, else. Impl- and they're like, oh, Johnny Thunder. You're like, you're you're dumb. You they're didn't get any money. so mad at this guy. It's like, yeah. what the hell? He didn't do anything wrong. He's trying to raise money. I guess his power is like he can – if he makes a wish, it like comes true. You know, this lightning bolt guy makes it come true. So he says, well, what if, uh, what if Superman, Batman, and, uh, you know, the Flash showed up each with $100,000? Would you guys be cool then? And sure enough, boom, that Thunderbolt guy brings all of them there with $100,000 each. 
Yep. Yeah. They just had it lying around and we're ready to go in the last 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, Superman says, well, you know, some uh, there's a coal yard in Metropolis that's going to be missing some, uh, you know, lumps of coal. So I yeah, just squeeze them into diamonds. Full hand of diamonds. Yeah. yeah. So at least that makes sense. They gave him a good one. And then Batman, that, obviously, you got to just not tell him, like, oh, I already had this money in my own house. <laughs> but but the my favorite part is that he says, Robin and I got busy right away, too. Here's our share. <laughs> You're <laughs> making pornos. Batman <laughs> <laughs> Robin porno. And then uh, Flash says, in mind, someday when you're a big boy, Johnny, we'll tell you how we did it. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, there were some real shots fired in here. Oh, oh there's um, my favorite. Later. Later. Yeah. Later. <laughs> With the Flash. Holy hell. Oh, boy. <laughs> People are taking shots left and right. Uh, so, yeah, everyone's happy now. They got their million dollars. Uh, no one really apologizes to Johnny Thunder, though. <laughs> they just got the money. They're all happy. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the one guy was like, "Huh? You didn't get your three hundred grand, and you call yourself a man, member of the Justice Society? <laughs> yeah. And what kind of piker is that living thunderbolt of yours that he couldn't help you raise the money? <laughs> you know, like, I thought getting caught thrown under the bus. Yeah, mostly, mostly it's Sandman, and maybe the Adam chiming in a little bit. But Sandman seems like a real creep. And this is old school Sandman. He's like a guy who wore a fedora and a gas mask. Yeah, and like a trench. He's pretty awesome. This guy, I'm a big fan of him. And he has his gun that shoots like knockout gas or something. And the Adam, he's a shorter fella, like maybe five three or something like that. But he's a re- real good boxer, and he wears like a blue, a cool blue mask and a cape. And it, but he's got like a yellow shirt. And I always liked the Adam back in the day. This Adam, he he can't Adam. shrink or anything. Yeah, I don't know why he's called Adam. Can he grow? He's a small guy. So. Oh. But uh yeah, no apologies to Johnny Thunder and all the guys there. When they first started digging into him, I thought it was just a rib, you know. I thought they were just goofing around, and then they say, "Oh, don't worry about Johnny Thunder, we got you covered." But no, they were really creeps to him. Yeah. Sure. yeah. By the end of the issue, he's one of the last people left, so you better be nice to Johnny Thunder. Yeah, there's a big turnover in the roster here for uh, yeah. Justice Society. But uh, Green Lantern says, "All right, I got to take this money to uh, old Janklin Delano Roosevelt, you know, our president." And uh, Doctor Fate says, "Hey, you mind if I come with you?" He's like, "Yeah, come on, come for the ride." As soon as they go outside, you know, uh, Dr. Pace says, hey, by the way, I'm not coming just for the trip. I think there's trouble at the White House. I'm sensing trouble. They show up, and what do they find at the White House, Jenny? Uh, the president is in bed. I guess he's a single guy. Uh, no <laughs> lady, apparently. Uh, Earth two, he, he dumped Eleanor a long time ago. In Earth two. <laughs> um, but he's being attacked by two shadows. Yeah. Shadowy figures that are really just actually shadowy figures, like they're made of shadow. Yeah, and then the uh, Green Lantern zaps him with his power ring there, and then uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Fate does some onk stuff, and they transform him back to normal humans. Yeah. Yep. So they're no longer like shadows. You hear onks? Well, we can't tell you. We don't dare. He'd kill us. Shouldn't they know, like, uh, Dr. Fate fought Karkle when he had a machine that could turn people into shadows? Shouldn't Dr. Fate go, yeah. oh, Ian Karkle, this is his gimmick. This is what he does. Yeah, but uh, he got turned into a shadow himself. This is definitely going to be him. <laughs> so Doctor Fate is still trying to hypnotize him to figure out uh, what they did or who sent them there, and then he starts, "Oh yeah, we got all right." He's like, "All right, now I see. Yeah, it's Ian Carkle, you know." But then uh, the guys just burst into flames. But this is another <laughs> Roy Thomas <laughs> gem here back. in terms of storytelling. So two human beings burst into flames, but then uh, Green Lantern says, "Hold it, Fate. Those two hoods are gone." Totally consumed, but there's something else I can see in the flames. If only I can, and he uses his power ring to pull out, got it, a piece of paper. Must have fallen from one of their pockets. <laughs> <laughs> the fires were hot enough to consume human bodies, <laughs> but not a piece of paper. <laughs> it's slow burning paper, apparently. Oh, good Lord. So he looks at this list. Holy, it's a list of some kind. Ten locations around the country, starting with the White House. And behind each place, the name of some old enemy of the J- of a JS Ayer or some other mystery man. Yeah. So, like, all right, there's a hit list. We got a hit list out. This old, is just uh, like an Andy Starris movie. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Just a lot of characters being sent after different targets and... Uh, but I, I like this premise, you know, get all these villains and the heroes got to pair up and go after the he- villains. 
solid comic book premise. Big fan of this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a shame that none of them are actually battles, really. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and they like uh, even though Here's it's an annual, I'm easily knocking out this person. All yeah. right. Yeah, we got we got cheated on like the Spectre, Sandman, Adam, <laughs> Hawkman, one panel each for their fights. All right, Doctor Fate. He puts a spell of protection over the White House for the next twenty four hours, and we get another ad here. We get a letters page, and then another ad for Jem, mm-hmm. son of Saturn. Remember, this was the guy I was telling you about a couple weeks ago. I had yeah. never, I don't remember him at all. And it's drawn by Gene Colan. Yeah, but like Gene Colan and Claus Jansen are the art team. That's yeah, that's pretty, pretty awesome. good. Yeah. I like the looks of this, yeah. He's basically like a, a red alien guy with long, skinny fingers. And yeah, kind of like the Martian Manhunter, but red. Yes. In fact, I think uh, when I was reading up on him, I think he was supposed to be the Martian Manhunter's like cousin or something. But then uh, they did something like that couldn't work, so they just made him his own character. And they made him son of Saturn instead of a Martian guy. So mm-hmm. they just like revamped him real quick. But originally, I think he was supposed to be connected to the Martian Manhunter. But yeah, so maybe we'll read that uh, gem, son of Saturn, son of Saturn yeah. at some point. All There's right. So, lot. yeah, the the guy, Dr. Fate and Green Lantern fly back to Justice Society and they're telling all the heroes, you know, what happened at the White House. They're like, all right, guess we got to go get these villains. And they all go busting out and they say, let's hear it, JSAers. For America and democracy. <laughs> Great. Very 40s. And then the old Johnny Thunders are like, hey, how come I'm not getting to go anywhere, uh, Green Lantern? And Green Lantern is like, hey, well, we need you here, Johnny, in case, you know, uh, the phone rings or something. I don't know. you got to stay here. I don't know. <laughs> I get hungry. You need to make us a sandwich later. <laughs> so they leave. All right. So now we see the bad guys. And they're getting their forces together. We see Ian Carkle, the shadow fella. And then, uh, Jank, why don't you go through the uh, the roster of villains here that we have? Oh, boy. A notable just array of everybody you've always been waiting to see again. Uh, we got Dr. Doog. He's like an old man, looks like the vulture, and he's just kind of wearing a bathrobe. All right. Dr. <laughs> Doog, first appearance, Adventure Comics 61, 1941. Jack Burnley uh, created him. He was a criminal scientist and enemy of Starman. He tried to control all the electricity in the U.S. He was originally named Dr. Doom, but the editor oh. changed it for some unknown reason. <laughs> wow. So, again, Dr. Doog. I know. We get so close, DC. Yeah. <laughs> we get a tarantula <laughs> instead of Spider-Man, and we get Dr. Doog instead of Dr. <laughs> Doom. History could have been way different if those people didn't change those names. God. Uh, Do you think it was because Doog is good backwards? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's probably what it is. It's the reverse. <laughs> yeah. Look at you figuring that one out. Yeah. All right. So, mm-hmm. all right. So that's Dr. Doog. Next. Uh, then we got the Catwoman, who we discussed already, has her big weird cat head. But yeah, yeah. She's wearing like an orange dress, real low cut. So you see a lot of cleavage, and she's got like a little red it's cape like on. Too. Yeah, and a red cape. Yeah. And red high heels, the straps around the ankle. It's a good look. And a cat face, just a cat face. <laughs> yep. It's very strange to look at. You're a cat. This foxy lady with the cat head. Very strange. <laughs> yeah, very confusing. <laughs> I do in this situation. <laughs> Next. Oh, boy. Then we get uh, Sewer Satan. Yeah, I think it's pronounced okay. Sir. I guess it's an archa- oh, okay. archaic version of Sir, but it's spelled S-I-E-U-R, Sir Satan. Yeah. And he first appeared in Flash Comics issue 1, 1940, created by Gardner Fox and Harry Lampert. He was an evil scientist involved in espionage schemes for unidentified foreign powers. Mm-hmm. That was his game. All these scientists. Every villain back in the day was a scientist. Yeah. These guys are all jerks. I mean, they had to be, I guess. <laughs> yeah, where else are you going to get your powers? Yeah, he's kind of like a hunched over bald guy with like a goatee and just a green suit. Doesn't look I want to guess he was kind of based on Peter Lorre, maybe with a bald yes. head. Yeah, yeah, I can totally see that. And then next up, we got Alexander the Great. He uh, first appearance Flash Comics issue two, nineteen forty. Gardner Fox and Dennis Neville created him, an evil physicist who built a machine that increased the mass of any object, and he was a Hawkman villain. And he called himself Alexander the Great because he said he was going to take over the world or whatever. You know? So it's yeah, cool. kind of like the leader or uh, the lobe from Freakazoid. Yeah, he's got a big brain on him. 
So yep, you know, big old brain, just hanging brain everywhere. <laughs> and he wears a bow tie and a gray suit. A dapper for a guy with a freakish head. <laughs> uh, next up, we got the Lightning Master. Uh, <laughs> it looks like he's in the KKK and Hydra at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> a very apt description of Lightning Master. Yeah, yeah, green robe, green mask, but lightning, a yellow lightning bolt on it. And I guess he fought Superman, I think, and he just yeah wanted to control lightning. That's about it. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't really look him up. Yeah. Very <laughs> low, uh, yeah, goals. Next up, we got another guy in a hood, the tarantula. Not the good one we saw yeah. at the beginning. This totally other tarantula guy. I forgot to look him up. I'm very busy. But, yeah, he's in an orange suit, a white shirt, a blue, like, hooded cape. Are those gloves he's wearing, or are those his hands? Green gloves. Yeah, they look to be gloves, I think. I but hope. randomly people will be colored green in this issue for some reason. So <laughs> yeah, Green know. Lantern was looking very greenish earlier. For some <laughs> yeah. A little seasick. All right, we got two more. Uh, then we got Zor. Uh, he's just a magician guy. Like, I don't know, David Cassidy from Columbo, basically, as a supervillain. <laughs> well, that's Jack, that's Jack Cassidy. <laughs> Jack Cassidy, his dad. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's right. David the singer. But uh, <laughs> Zachary Zor, more fun comics, 55, 1940, Jerry Siegel and Bernard Bailey. He was part of a secret order of angels who live outside of time and space. But he's a bad guy, and he comes to Earth to try to take it over. And Spectre fought him three times. Wow. I mean, you should probably do something about him at that point. Like, but uh, I thought he, at first I thought he was like, uh, what's that foxy lady who's a magician? Oh, yeah, I thought maybe it was like her daddy or something. Some kind of connection, yeah. Zachary Zor. Uh, yep. But, yeah. James, yeah, I can see it. But apparently it's no relation. The last guy then is, uh, what is he, Zoltan? Or is that his name? Zotan? Wotan. 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 Yeah. And he was in the uh, All-Star Squadron issue we did back in the day. And he's the reason, I believe, that Mike L. Bust out laughing. Like something <laughs> that, that Wotan said. But he's a green guy. He looks like a devil, like his hair and a beard and everything, and he dresses in red and green outfit. And he's kind of like a magician, sorcerer kind of guy. Like a green Doctor Strange in a lot of ways. Yeah, there you go. That's about right. Yep. Like a little bit of Wolverine hair going on. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, Ian Carkle, the shadow guy, is commanding them all. And he's going to pay them. Oh, wait, what is he paying them a hundred grand too? A lot of hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars are being thrown around. <laughs> that keeps coming around, yeah. Yeah, so they each have a mission to go kill somebody at these locations. And if they accomplish their mission, they'll get a hundred grand. Did you pick up on what was going on throughout the issue? Like why they were going to these places and why they had to kill these people? It's revealed at the end, but did you have any hint of what they were doing? Uh, I guess maybe about halfway through, I was kind of figuring, okay, a little yeah. bit of what's going on there. Yeah, if you're really paying attention, you kind of put it together, but I don't know. Yeah. When, when I was a kid, I had no idea what this is about. <laughs> like if you, <laughs> Like, I don't remember anything about this except the fights between the villains and heroes. That's all I cared about, you know, mm -hmm. and the two curse words. All right, so the first hero we see is Superman. Got to start out with Superman. And this is Wayne Boring on art and Jerry Ordway as well. Uh, why don't you – because, man, I was confused by uh, uh, Superman's affection slash disdain for Lois Lane. It doesn't exactly <laughs> well, treat her properly. Uh, yeah, not so much. But it's uh, yeah, Superman's flying around. Uh, he is like, oh, somebody's going to destroy this hospital. So I got to stop that. You know, Lightning Master is, is around here. I'm going to find him. There's this really dark cloud. He's like looking at the cloud with his x-ray vision. And he sees that there's an airplane there that is being flown by Lois Lane herself. Who knew she was such a good pilot? I know. She's just flying a plane by herself. <laughs> I, mean, I guess she's like the daughter of an army general. So maybe, but he was an airplane. <laughs> But then the, the plane gets zapped by a bolt of lightning. She has she to just eject. right out. Now, she's wearing a parachute and everything, but she's screaming, help. Superman catches her. He's like, you're pretty lucky I'm around. Yeah, she's like, to paraphrase Mae West, luck had nothing to do with it, Superman. <laughs> I figured you'd be here once I heard the live lightning master was uh, still alive and headed this way. Yeah, so there's like a giant black cloud in the sky, and she's flying into the cloud. And I guess that cloud is disguising lightning master's uh, ship or whatever. And Superman, he says, oh, all right, you know, yeah, that could be Lightning Master there in that cloud. All right, Lois, I'll see you later. And he just drops yep. her. <laughs> you got a parachute. Figure it out. Well, why'd you save her anyway? You know? <laughs> but he just, 
You're super, you could have like flown her down to the ground and then flown back up, Superman. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, he ends up doing that because apparently this is the <laughs> slowest moving parachute ever created. <laughs> yeah, he just drops her there like a sack of potatoes. And then he goes in after Lightning Master. Lightning Master zaps an American flag, first of all. What a jerk. Yeah. Just that. Uh, what a fuck. And then he zaps Superman. And he's kind of like uh, hurting Superman here, apparently. Yeah. It's finally, apparently the first time they fought nothing, but he's, he's amped it up and now it's getting him. Yeah. It kind of knocks Superman silly. But then when do you know it? Here comes Johnny Thunder and his lightning bolt guy. They saved the day. Who would have thought of anyone on this team that Superman would be the one who needs help? But hey, Johnny Thunder, those sandwiches at headquarters aren't going to make themselves. What are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. I wanted all the bathrooms clean today. All of them. He creates just enough of a distraction for Superman to recover, and then he busts in through the ship and uh, KOs the Lightning Master, right? And then still has time to go pick up Lois Lane, who is still falling in that parachute <laughs> <laughs> after defeating this whole villainous plot. <laughs> and she wants to know what's going on because there's a big story here. You know, Lois Lane, she's always after the story, that Lois. Superman's going to take her long. Now we get to a uh, two-page spread. Explain to the rest of the team. Like, hey, I brought a reporter with with me. <laughs> she said she wanted to. What was I going to do? So, all right. Uh, now we get a two-page spread of uh, Hawkman and Hawkgirl. Yeah, Hawkgirl, her first appearance. She wasn't even at the meeting earlier, right? No. Yeah, they, they keep throwing more characters into this book. I'm like, I don't know. What's going on anymore? And we, and we just see uh, Hawkgirl flying in front. And then, oh, is she, oh she's kicking <laughs> Alexander the Great in the cap. <laughs> Yeah, she, uh, she pioneered the calf kicks in MMA many years before, and then a Hawkman's Hawkman's punching him in the face at the same time, so it's a yeah. deadly combo. Reminds me of like uh, Midnight Express. I think he used to do something similar to that in the <laughs> wrestling world: kick out the legs and hit him in the. I think, but right. anyway, um, uh, Hawkman cracks him in the face, and that's it for Alexander the Great. He was going to bust up a hotel in. Uh, did they say the location of this hotel? Oh, Texas. They just say the Lone Star State. And then we get the Spectre fighting Zor, and they're both, like, gigantic, taller than buildings, and they're fighting. Godzilla, and, it's like Godzilla versus King Kong is what we got right here. Spectre has no trouble. And we see yeah, Sandman. Like, out how. It's just like, he's like, oh, your power dwarfs mine. Guess yeah. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of standing there right now. And then with Sandman and Adam both team up to take out the Tarantula. He was going to blow up something. He had uh, one of them plunger deals with dynamite attached to it. <laughs> Yep, he's going to blow up a mansion, apparently. In New England. Adam cracks him with the right hand, and uh, Sandman hits him with the sand gun, the gas gun, and they're arguing over who took him out first, you know? It's like, hey, I got him with my gun. No, I got him with my fist. And now we cut to the Flash. Good old Jay Garrett. Flash. Yeah, he gets some, him and Superman got big introductions. The rest of them, eh. And he's at uh, United States Army Base in Fort Lewis, Washington State. Yeah, I've been there. Well, why? Court Martial? Uh, what was going on? Why are you <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's taking us there when we go out to Washington, because he was in the uh, he was stationed there, so he gets in and he can bring like guests and stuff. So wow, I don't know if I like that from a national security perspective. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know. That just seems <laughs> crazy. He just like me friends and relatives. The military base. <laughs> uh, see any aliens? Did you see any? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, so uh, we see the flasher. This is Carmine Infantino. And I, I liked his uh, art here. Uh, yeah, that's pretty solid. Yeah, good old comic book art. And uh, he's, he, Flash runs in, and he's like, I made good time here, you know, ran across the country. And he's like, all right, everybody, no one can leave or enter the base until I check things out. Because mm -hmm. we got a, a villain here to kill somebody. There's uh, They're talking to somebody. Uh, I'm sorry, Colonel, I'm sure the delay uh, will only be temporary. You know, they got to keep the Colonel on the base. And that Colonel, I think, is somewhat famous. But, uh, yeah. yeah. And then we see another, is this a, who's this guy coming to major with his daughter? His daughter's this foxy blonde. And I guess she knows, uh, Jay Garrick, the Flash. I'm a little confused because it seems like uh, they're very familiar with each other, but this is all the way across the country. So, uh, I guess the Flash yeah. patrols the entire country. He just he does laps. <laughs> that is weird. Maybe she like left town or something and he just goes to visit her in two seconds. It's easy for him. But, uh, he says, Hey, look out. We got a, there's a villain here somewhere. And here an earthquake starts, like a just big, uh, rip in the earth. And he's like, oh, I better go investigate this. And he goes to jump down, and she just jumps on his back. Yeah, she's like, I'm dying of boredom. You gotta take me with you. What is wrong with you? This is no picnic. I'm, I'm uh, going on. I'm betting this quake was man-made. 
And yeah, they jump down in the hole there, and there's uh, Sir Satan with his drill machine yep. digging into the earth. And the trade in that earth, raw dog in it. And uh, Carmine Infantino, he's doing some school, cool, like, sketchy stuff here. Like, he's making the vibrations in the panel, so, yeah, you know, like, outlined and stuff. And basically, the Flash is returning the the uh, vibrations back to the drill machine. Like, he's vibrating fast. You think this would be messing up that girl, though, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was right on his back the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. That can't feel good. Or maybe it does feel really good, you know, depending on how you think about it. So she, the, the vibrations kill the drill machine, and then he takes her and jumps out of the, the hole there, and he's running away with her. And, you know, because they beat Sir Satan again, two panels, he's done. All these villains stink. They're very bad at their jobs. Why don't you um, break down this discussion here between uh, Flash and what's her name? Uh, I don't even know her name. Joan, I think they mentioned. Uh, yeah, Joan. Joan. Yeah, she says she calls herself little Joni here. Yeah, so Joan. Yeah. All right, so why don't you tell us uh, this conversation? This is my favorite moment of the book. So she says, maybe Sir Satan's really finished this time. He's like, probably. Now I'll take you back to your father. Not on your life, lover. I know you and your JSA. If this is part of a bigger caper, little Joni wants in. Or I'll tell everybody. Tell them what? Some of the other ways you're quick on the trigger. <laughs> what? what could that possibly uh, mean besides fire. the obvious? You know, yep. like, what is Roy Thomas trying to do here? <laughs> besides the obvious <laughs> joke. Like, yeah, a little this quick credits the, the Flash as a lover. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's no other tra- – like, what else could that possibly mean? I, I don't know. So, no, yeah, Roy Thomas. I don't think anything. Good Lord. <laughs> Snuck that one past the senses. Even young Mike Dell, who was impressed about those swear words, didn't catch on to I that. Know. I had no idea. So, man, Flash is getting buried here. Little Johnny takes no prisoners. No. At least, that, yeah, it makes more sense why he brought her. Like, he, she's got dirt on him, but Lois, <laughs> there's no reason to bring her. All right, so now we cut to a California movie set. And Batman and the Batmobile just crash right through the gates <laughs> into the movie set. Yeah. Yeah. Is that necessary, Batman? No. In retrospect, yeah. I don't know if sending Batman on this one was a smart choice. <laughs> and the yeah, art no. here is uh, Don Newton and uh, Mike Macklin. So they pull up on a movie set and they're running around. They see some actors on the set. And I guess for those paying attention, this is a famous Ronald Reagan movie that is being made here. Hmm. Trying to see, see the that. connection. And then uh, they look up in the catwalk and they see Catwoman in her little sexy dress and high heels and cat mask. And they go up and fight Catwoman. Uh, but there's a fire on the set. Batman pours out some sand. And yeah. then Robin says, uh, she's, she's got a fight. gun. <laughs> hey, Batman, while you're dicking around with that sand, she's got a gun. And what happens now, Jack? She's making her speech. And why shouldn't I have one? They come in handy from time to time, most handy, and she blasts. You see her two shots fired off, and uh, you're like, oh, no, she shot Batman and Robin, but no. She shot an assassin behind them who was also going to take them out. (laughs) So she actually saved their lives, but apparently also took one in the shoulder while she was at it. Batman just rips the mask off. He's like, I need to see your normal face. This cat thing isn't working for me. Now I'll help you, (laughs) now that you're pretty. (laughs) Yeah, she passes off from shock, but Batman says she'll be fine. The prison hospital will take care of her. Yeah, what a jerk this Batman is. Still putting her in prison. <laughs> she just saved her life. Still putting her in prison. Yeah, Batman, summarized, he uh, theorized that, I guess, uh, whoever's behind all this, they knew that Catwoman may not, she's not a killer. She she might waver, so they send it back up. And then she took out the guy who was going to kill Batman. But he's still putting her in prison. Because Batman she's is a jerk. So there you go. What do you think of this Batmobile? It's the old school Batmobile. It's a big bat head on the front. Yeah, that was definitely a look. Um, I'm not going to say it's my favorite. I think I think I think I'll always still like the 1989 one the best. This next one might be the most interesting one for many reasons. Yeah, I forgot about what happened here. Yeah, <laughs> when I was a kid, this haunted me. Green Lantern <laughs> Never and Wotan. <laughs> they're, they're duking it out in the in a park somewhere. Uh, I, I forget where they say this one is. Um, because the locations of these events kind of important to pe- put all the pieces together. The art here is by Mark Nodell and Joe Gella. Seems a million miles away from Europe and Asia, torn by war. I don't think it says what town it is, though. 
All right, so Green Lantern and Wotan are fighting. Wotan's got some sort of a gun that shoots out, like, pink energy, and it's able to dispel Green Lantern's green energy. So uh, they're fighting in the park, uh, Wotan and Green. This was weird, though, because Wotan gets the drop on him, and Green Lantern is, like, begging. He's like, no, please, I beg you, spare me. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of crying a little bit, almost. Like, he's wiping away a tear. Yeah. And Wotan's like, oh, so you turned out to be a yellow lantern after all. A <laughs> foe unworthy of my metal. And he just zaps him right in the chest. GL is hurled backward as if hit by a battering ram, fluttering to earth in a small wooded area on the edge of town. And then Wotan just says, is still alive. Then I'll dispose of you and get on with my mission. And Green Lantern says, so groggy, but my plan worked. <laughs> what was the plan? <laughs> Beg for your life and then get shot in the chest. Is that a plan? <laughs> I don't know. Not your finest work. I don't know why they made you chairman of this. Uh, he internalized his ring's power, so it nearly stunned me. And now it's my turn. And he zaps Wotan with his energy ring. Why couldn't he have just done that to begin with? Yeah. Yeah. Would have knocked over less trees, killed less children. <laughs> That's exactly right. Because Wotan, when he's getting hit by the energy ring, his gun goes off. And it zaps a tree off in the distance. The tree cracks, falls down on a shadowy form, and crushes the person. <laughs> and Green Lantern goes over. And he can't save him, Jank. Why? Because the tree's made of wood. That's right. Back to wood. <laughs> so maybe I can still know dead already, crushed by the tree. <laughs> He's hanging over the tree with his hand on his forehead. He's like, and so young, just a kid, really. God forgive me. I keep myself busy with schemes for the Justice Society to help children. But the first time I get my chance one on one, a child dies and I can only watch. Man, nine year old me was shaken by this. It's like, oh my yeah. God. Like, I'm get never done. Superhero now. So then the next panel, there's a little narration box. Soon, after the broken body is delivered to authorities. <laughs> <laughs> And Green Lantern's just flying away. Wonder if somehow that child was the very person Ian Carkle wanted killed. No way to find out till we locate Carkle and drag all his secrets out between his teeth. So now we cut to Iron, or Our Man. And for those who don't remember Our Man, he's a fella who he took a pill and it gave him superpowers for one hour. Yep. That's it. So naturally. It's like a bad idea to name yourself Our Man then. <laughs> like, let's yeah. tell everyone what the secret is. <laughs> That I only have these powers for 60 minutes, and they can la outlast me, and I'm going to hey, be screwed. But the ladies love them. But anyway, when you, <laughs> when, you, when you have this sort of power, what you do when you uh, land someplace and you don't know where the villain is, you want to take the pill immediately. Because when we pick up the story here, our man's already been running around uh, looking for this villain for a good, oh, how long does he say here, 50 minutes or something? And he's like, <laughs> I only have a few minutes left of speed and strength before yeah. I'm back to Mr. Ordinary. Could have just rented a car and then taken the thing when you got there. But the art here is by George Perez and Jerry Orway. How do you feel about Iron Man's costume? Like yellow and black, a yellow mask hood and a cape and a little hourglass around his neck? Not bad. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen. So he uh, senses that the villain is up in this like uh, little tower thing or something, I guess, because there's electricity crackling or something. I don't know. And he's mm -hmm. like, oh, you know what? I better take another pill. So he pops another pill. But he's been having uh, side effects from the pills, you know. So he, do he doesn't like taking them too much, but he's like, I got to. So he pops another pill. Then he just climbs right up. Like, it looks like a little lighthouse or something. He just climbs up the side of it, punching his hands and feet into the sides of the wall. And he's like, I sure hope the villain's up there. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to, you know, we're going to be in trouble for destroying property. And then he uh, cr crashes through the window. And he's like, oh, Dr. Doog, I presume. <laughs> and uh Dr. Duke says, You have me at a disadvantage. <laughs> you have me at a disadvantage, sir. Uh Minute Man, is it not? And about <laughs> fifty nine minutes slow, Baldy. <laughs> tell me what you're trying to do out there. Uh deep fry everybody within a twenty mile radius. But Dr. Duke just zaps him with like some uh lightning bolt stuff. And our man's in trouble right away. He's trying to put on a brave face that he's like, I'm gonna come get get you, dude. But it, and internally, he's like, holy hell, this dude guy is tough. <laughs> I may not be able to make it here. <laughs> I'm getting. And then I, who comes in to save the day, Jack? Our buddy Starman. I don't know. I don't know that I've ever seen this Starman before. But Oh, really? Yeah. No, I don't think so. Yeah, he's wearing like a red costume. 
green underpants, green boots, yellow star on the chest, yellow belt, green cape. Again, he's not wearing a mask. It's like a uh, it covers his forehead and his hair and his ears, but his face is exp- and he's got like a red fin on top of his head. And he's got his gravity rod, which uh, is a deadly, <laughs> deadly gravity rod. But he just pops down and he just punches uh, Doctor Doog in the face, and that's it. And now, what uh, does he, the gravity rod do? Does it just control gravity? Because it seems to just be zapping things. Well, yeah, he can fly with it, you know, and uh, it, it has a bunch of things, and it's a gravity rod. It's really good. So they he picks up our man and they fly off, and now we get to Doctor Fate, Keith Giffen. Yeah, so the art gets real good. Yeah, describe the art for the people who can't see it, Jank. Like, uh, what kind of style? Who would you say it's similar to? Uh, to me, it was very McFarlane-esque, to be honest. Oh, I don't think so. This is way better than McFarlane. <laughs> this is uh, a lot of heavy black inks. Yeah, yeah. this does not look un- unlike that Hulk we did recently. Well, you know what? In fairness, yes, because we don't get to see any human faces or anything. So, yeah, yeah I-, I guess you could say it's a little hard. As long as you don't see humans, McFarlane's pretty good. It's, it's kind of, I don't know, there's even like a little Magnola in there at certain points. Yeah, yeah. I would say there's a Mike Magnola in there, obviously, and uh, maybe a little McFarlane. But yeah, just real heavy black inks. It's pretty awesome. So why don't you describe uh, this whole scenario here with Dr. Fate? So he is flying. I think he's supposed to be just going after Karkle himself. But on the way, he just happens to be flying over a boat that's like ferrying you know fruit supposedly from uh, from latin yeah. america he, and he's was like oh i know all about these and it's being like it caught up in the storm so he's like oh i gotta help him out so he like uses his powers to like move them safely into like a calmer part of the sea there's like a giant tidal wave that comes up and just kind of lifts them and moves them over to a, to a nicer area and uh, he sees that there's a man on the on the deck of the boat who's like, you know, kind of throwing up. And he's like, well, this man will thank his stars tonight that he will suffer not this day, but fearful memories and the brief vagaries of seasickness. Uh, so he saves some guy in a, in a Hawaiian shirt here. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, then he flies into the, like the house where he thinks Karkle is and he busts through the wall. And it's all just mad. But the inside of the house, Jank, it's made of human flesh. Yeah. That's pretty weird. And then Karkle's there in a shadowy form. And he's, like, dripping shadowy stuff all over Dr. Fate. And, again, lots of heavy blacks. <laughs> and Fate's trying to fight him off. And he starts doing the onk. He sees the onk in his eye when Karkle looks at Dr. Fate. He sees the onk. Because who's his uh, Nabu, right? Nabu, Nabu? Is, uh, yeah, like the god or whatever that he... Like his Kanshu, essentially, from Moon Knight. Yeah. And so he starts glowing with the Ankh power, starts radiating energy and stuff, and then uh, everything just turns, like, white and just some little speckles of black. That's a pretty cool panel. Minimalist. And then we turn the page, and we see Karko, and his eyes are wide, and now all of Justice Society is there. Yeah. Including Lois Lane and Joni. (laughs) So look out. (laughs) And they all, again, appear green for some reason. <laughs> They're all very sickly. <laughs> They're all seasick, like the guy in the boat. Yep. And then uh, Spectre, Green Lantern, and Starman all hit Ian Karkle in his shadowy form with all their weapons there, the ring and the Spectre power and the gravity rod. And, like, no one knows who Starman is. He just pops in. He's like, hey, I hope you don't mind if I uh, lend a hand here. What I did and- like is that he keeps... People may not know him yet, but he clearly wants them to because he's constantly campaigning to be let on the team. Yes. <laughs> not even giving them a chance to, like, answer. He's just like, hey, you guys need me. I'm here. And at one point, Green Lantern's like, all right, just calm down, buddy. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> I don't know. But, yeah, so Ian Carco grows real big, but then the Spectre grows real big, and he keeps zapping him with eye beams or whatever. And then Carco just explodes into all these shadowy fragments. And they rain down on all the Justice Society people. And they're like, what the hell was that? What just happened? And yeah, uh, you just get like shadow cancer. And Hawkman says, what was that? Does anybody else still feel a tingling sensation from that dark light? And Starman says, sure do. Uh, by the way, I call myself Starman. You guys don't know me, but <laughs> and, uh, <Green> <laughs> later, fella. Dr. Fate, you got any answers for us? about What happened? And then Dr. Fate almost <laughs> passes out. But what do they theorize here, Jank, that what happened there with Karkle? For moments ago, I felt years, even decades, wash over me as waves lapped the waiting shore. His shadow form stole time somehow from the future lives of random human beings. 
Ian Carkle reached into the future for knowledge of some kind, coming events perhaps, which he wished to affect, even prevent, and by doing so to harm this nation by wreaking havoc upon the laws and of cause and effect. The time he had captured now resides within each of you mortals. I can sense as much. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> uh, Lois Lane's like, how, how will this affect us? And Joni's like, easy girl. He said the time or whatever it was came into us, not out of us. And Flash is like, hey, easy yourself, Joan. Remember, not everybody has a boyfriend who traipses through the fourth dimension like I do. <laughs> Joni's got a mouth on her. So basically, they're saying uh, their lives have been extended now because they got hit with this stuff. But they yep. got extra time. So that explains how, you know, they're still around, you know, after all these years later, after Earth 2. <laughs> it was nice that they finally explained it like this many years in. Like, oh, here's here's why this is actually happening. Now, the downside of this is this was 1984, and, like, what, two years later, they had Crisis on Infinite Earths, and Earth 2 no longer existed. So yeah. they finally get a solution to it. <laughs> but I think they still refer back to this issue. Like, I think s- part of this still, you know, survives past Crisis on Infinite Earths. Yeah, time. that always seems to be the way. Like, they bring back parts of things, and then you're like, I don't even – this is more confusing. Yeah, DC is the worst. The absolute worst. <laughs> And then uh, Starman's like, borrow time, huh? Looks like I picked the uh, right time to start a new career as a masked hero. And then Adam's in the background like, he calls that a mask? I can see his face. <laughs> Hell. What are talking get about? a domino mask and move on. So then uh, they're checking on Our Man. Our Man's still all wobbly, you know, because he's taking the pills. He's on the smack. And he's like, yeah. you know what? I need to take a break from being Our Man. I need to just uh, step back here from the Justice Society. And then uh, Starman's like, leave of absence. It's a real shame. Hey, if JSA needs a replacement, <laughs> you know, I'm right here. <laughs> My name's Starman, remember? And I was here. <laughs> I love this guy. I loved everything he was doing here. <laughs> and uh, Green Lantern also says, hey, you know what? I think I'm done, too. You know, I just killed a kid with a tree. You know, <laughs> I just yeah. remember that. I just Talking killed my kid. weakness to wood. <laughs> I, think, I think I need to uh, regroup here and uh, reflect on what's been going on here in my life. So he's like, I want to take a little break, too. And uh, he leaves. Yeah. And I think I like the, uh, the panel where him and Hawkman are shaking hands and it looks like maybe it's just the scan copy here, but it looks like his ring is like flaring up and shooting a walnut into like Hawkman's <laughs> mouth. <Yeah. It> does. <laughs> a little nut. For, uh, <laughs> so uh, then uh, Dr. Fate says, you know what? I'm leaving too. Yeah. I felt that uh Nabu guy trying to get in. When I was fighting earlier, so I got to find out whether I'm in control or he is. Figure out if he's in me. So I get, oh, this is probably why they brought in Wonder Woman then, you know? All these fellows left. Yeah. Uh, They need new blood. So we see them all flying away. And then uh, Sandman says, nope, guess we'll just have to write this one off as the JSA mission the world's not ready to learn about just yet. Yeah, because they're trying to figure out what happened, you know? Like, uh, hey, uh, and all the rhubarb, anybody ever figure out exactly how that guy Karkle planned to alter America's future? And uh, they're like, nope, no idea. Maybe we'll never know. And then behind them is that same file folder, although yeah. it's not within a toolbox. It's nope. just among Somebody, the rest. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> someone cleaned it up eventually and put it in the toolbox. And uh, now we go back to the end, and we, or where we began with Tarantula and Wonder Woman uh, in the Parisphere, uh, reading about or, or watching everything that happened. And Tarantula is like, hey, Wonder Woman, you uh, kept a pretty good secret there, not telling anybody about this. She's like, hey, you know, this is before my time. I had nothing to do with this. Even though I was on the cover of the issue, I wasn't there. So don't bother. <laughs> and he's like, all right. So uh, they're looking at the the files again, and she's like, uh, what, do you, what do you think he was doing there, you know? What was all this about, Ian Carkle? I forget what the other swear is, but here at the end, uh, there's a big swear. The hell. There's a dam in there somewhere. I can't remember. I think it was Green Lantern. Maybe he's talking about the kid that died. Oh, yeah. That would make sense. Oh, yeah. A youngster died today, Hawk. Wotan crushed the life out of him with a tree like you'd step on a bug. And I couldn't do a damn thing to stop it. Nine-year-old me blushed. So (laughs) then we uh, cut to the end here. But Tarantula and Wonder Woman are looking at the fowls. And uh, he just drops them on the table there. He's like, I guess we'll never know what this is about. And we see a bunch of newspaper clippings and stuff. And he says, uh, we'll just have to wait and see what happens to the eight survivors in the years to come. But if uh, you want my educated guess, then we turn the page. Ian Carkle didn't know what the hell he was doing. But then, Jank, when we look closely at the newspaper clippings, what do we see? 
Colonel and Mrs. Dwight Eisenhower leave Fort Lewis for a Texas post. Hmm, sounds like something we saw earlier. Ford and Buchanan open law offices here. Pretty sure Gerald Ford. Yeah, Missouri Senator enters Arkansas Army Navy Hospital. Senator That's Harry S. Truman. So, yeah, putting it together now, right? Uh, Everyone's seeing what's going on. Nine-year-old me still had no idea what's going on. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Then we got the Kennedy siblings return Pianist Port from South America. Lyndon Johnson in a tight race for the Senate seat. Yep. It's kind mm-hmm. of a picture of Richard Nixon. Yeah. Lawyer and wife take Caribbean cruise. Is that really a newspaper article that way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lawyer and his wife Rich take a people cruise. took a cruise. Who would have thought? Uh, then we got Jimmy Carter, class of 41 graduates from Plains High School. So, yeah, all the yeah. presidents. I guess it was Jimmy Carter then that they, they got killed there, right? No, yeah, it was not Jimmy Carter who got killed. Uh, the, <laughs> the guy who got killed, yeah, unknown. Don't know who it was. I'm thinking it was Jimmy Carter. <laughs> no, <it wasn't. laughs> That's how I'm reading this. <laughs> it wasn't Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter would have been in the uh, Georgia with uh, Lightning Master. Lightning Master is going to blow up that Georgia town. That would have been Jimmy. Oh, okay. Yeah, the guy yeah. who died... We don't know who he is. It's a mystery. So it opens up. And apparently they never revealed who it was because that's something you could go back and revisit. Like, oh, yeah. that, guy, God, that would have oh. been. But they never did. So I, I think that's a missed opportunity. But, yeah, yeah so who knows? Like Elvis or something. And it's just like that movie where, like, <laughs> what if the Beatles never existed? And, like, you're the only one that remembers them. Maybe he would have been the good president. That guy who died. <laughs> he would have been the good one. But uh, so you never know who that guy is. Never figure, find out. So, yeah, all these presidents were saved thanks to the Justice Society. How about that? What an epic tale, Jack. What an epic tale. Yeah. Oh, there was so many adventures. Too bad none of them were satisfying. But other than that. <laughs> yeah, Roy Thomas, uh, again, for those we've talked about him many times on the show, especially in the first few years of, of the podcast. But yeah. he was basically Stanley's right-hand man at Marvel. And when I say man, I use that term very loosely because he's a kid. <laughs> he was like a teenager. And he was, yeah. he was like 18, Boy. 19 when he started. And he was uh, Stanley's right-hand man. And he had a big influence on him in the history of comic books. He's a great big picture guy. Like, yeah, a great idea guy. Mm-hmm. Not a great writer. He was never a trained writer. Again, he was a teenager when he started writing. No training, nothing. He's a horrible writer. But great comic book mind, you know? Yes. Yeah. But like he's an editor. editor. He should a be writer. an editor. Yeah. Yep. Roy Thomas. Not a writer. And even though this is 20 years after he got started in the business, whatever, his writing never got better. It's just awful. Just awful. All the dialogue is just brutal. It's just people don't talk like this, Roy. (laughs) You know, they just don't talk like this. What are you doing? But again, the big picture of this issue is pretty cool. Uh, The heroes have to get together and fight all these different villains. But like you said, the individual battles were pretty lame. Like, they were mostly over in one or two panels. Yeah, and even the other ones, like, it was never really in, like, they were never in jeopardy. It was like, oh, yeah, they're easily going to win this. Green Lantern was begging for his life, though, but that was part of his plan. Yeah? That was part of his plan. Very stupid plan, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I liked a lot. I liked the big picture of this issue, but the actual writing, the dialogue, awful. Just awful. Downright dreadful. Yeah. But, yeah, it's Roy Thomas. That's what you expect. Now, the art, we got a bunch of different uh, – we both like the Keith Giffen stuff. I think that was clearly the best art in this book. Um, we get some nice yeah. Carmine Infantino, some uh, OK George Perez in here. Uh, overall, the art was strong. Uh, yeah, there weren't too many where it was – oh, no, an awful. At the lowest, it was perfectly serviceable. <laughs> it was fine. Like sure. nothing, nothing embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, that is, at all. that is kind of a, a rarity when you have this many artists, that nobody is just a clear weak link. Yeah, the Keith Giffen stuff was great, though. That's top-notch. Yeah. yeah. Go back All right. That. Any other uh, points you'd like to make about this? Did we miss anything? No, I think we hit the big ones. Um, yeah, that Joni moment, that was pretty yeah. great. <laughs> was great. Uh-huh. I was just going to bring that back up. <laughs> Quick on the trigger. Got to give him that. So every once in a while, Roy Thomas gets into some good dialogue like that, and uh, <laughs> just everything Starman was doing with trying to get a team. <laughs> pretty awesome. So I guess there were moments like that that it was good, but the rest of it, eh. Yeah, Superman just dropping Lois Lane. Uh, yeah. Got a parachute lady. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, yeah, it had its moments. 
Yeah, for nostalgia reasons, I I still love this. I still remember those panels of Green Lantern over that tree. Just thinking, oh, this kid got squashed by a tree. <laughs> I was terrified. Yeah. yeah, it's the one time the hero <laughs> fails. You're like, why is this happening? Soon after the broken body was dropped off at authorities. <laughs> what the <hell>? <laughs> <laughs> a better transition than that, Roy Thomas. I don't know. One out of ten, I'm still giving it a seven. This is a good fun for me. Well, you know, I'll give it a six. Yeah. Um, I think the six is fair. It's yeah, uh, solid enough. It's got weird, goofy moments, so that's always a plus. Yeah, if I didn't read this as a kid, it would be a five or six, but, you know, I still can envision myself as a lad in the backyard <laughs> reading this comic. I loved it. Um, all right, Jank, it's your pick. What do you got for us? All right. Well, I figured we would go back to Marvel. I know you're going to pick some more DC books coming up here, <laughs> but <laughs> I decided to go with Kazar the Savage, number hey. 12. Number 12, Kazar the Savage. Now, there's a couple different Kazars. What year yes. is this? Uh, this is the kind of 80s one. This oh. book came out March 82, it says. Okay, yeah, because there was one in the 70s briefly, and then uh, there was one in the early 80s briefly. Kazar never had a lot of long runs, I don't think. No. <laughs> it was one in the 90s, I think, made it about 18 issues or something like that. Yeah. Never that, very long. Because at that point, people are, they finally realize, oh, wait, is it, this isn't Tarzan. What are we doing? <laughs> it's Kazar. It's Kazar. But he was on my list because he is one of the Marvel books we haven't done yet in the four years yeah. of the show. So, uh, Kazar, are there any special villains or anything in this issue? Why, why did you pick this one? Did it jump yeah, this is, uh, this one has Belasco in it. Oh, the demon from uh, Limbo. Yeah. Yep. He apparently, I guess, just his first appearance was number 11. But I looked at that one, and it's kind of just like uh, his backstory. Like, he doesn't show up to the last page, and then he's kind of talking about how he got to be what he is. But, like, this is kind of his first, I would say, full appearance. Yeah, it's always a weird thing in comics. Like, you get first appearance, but first <laughs> full appearance. You know, like, uh, sometimes yeah. they'll just appear in the last panel. It's like, yeah, all right. What are you going to do? All right, so Kazar, issue 12 from, did you say 82? Yep, March of 82. Do you know who the creators are on this? It was written by Bruce Jones and art by Brent Anderson. Okay, we've talked about Brent Anderson on the show before, but uh, I don't know the Jones fella, so we'll research him. I'm just relieved it's not Roy Thomas. All right, so there it is next week on the big show, Kazar. And uh, once again, if you're watching us on YouTube, please like and subscribe. The, the drive to 100. Can we get to 100 by next week? Let's hope. Let's rally the troops. Get the flea <laughs> army out in the streets. All right. So until then, uh, don't get any jank on you. <laughs>